What's going on guys, Justin here, and welcome back to our 13th example video following our course on proof writing. Now, today's examples will be on disproving statements. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first example. For this one, we want to prove that for all natural numbers, n, the function f of n, which is equal to 36n squared minus 810n plus 2753 is prime. So as this is a for all, we are going to disprove this using an existential, which is to show a counterexample. So first I want to note some things that might help you to arrive at the counterexample. So for 36, 36 is equal to 6 squared. 810 is equal to 2 times 5 times 3 to the third. And lastly, 2753 is prime. Great. So looking at these factorizations, what I did in order to find a counterexample was I looked at powers of 3 for n, powers of 3 times 2, and powers of 3 times 5. And after trying a bunch of those different combinations, what I found was that n equals 45 is a counterexample. So that'll give you 36 times 45 squared minus 810 times 45 plus 2,753. And that is equal to 39,203, which is equal to 197 times 199, and therefore definitely not prime. So that completes this disproof, where you have disproved this for all statement using a counterexample. So let's go ahead and get into the next proof. Great. So this one says if A, B, C, and D are sets, then we have the following equality. We have that A cross B union C cross D is equal to A union C cross B union D. Now we can read this as a for all statement as well as we have for all A, B, C, and D that this equality will hold true. So we are also going to disprove this one using a counterexample. So we're going to let A be the set one, two, three, and four. We're gonna let B be the set one, two, and three. We're gonna let C be the set one and five. And lastly, D will be just the singleton six. Great, so let's go ahead and examine both sides of this equation here with this information in mind. So if we look at the right hand side of our equation here, we have A union C cross B union D. So if we union A with C, we'll get the numbers one through five. If we union B with D, we'll get one through three and then just six. So it's possible to construct an ordered pair that is contained within one side of the equation and not the other. So let's consider the set five comma one. So we can see that five is an element of C, so that comes from, so that comes from this right here. And then one is an element from B, A, and C, but in this case, it will be coming from the B right here. So let's see if we can construct the set five, one from A cross B or from C cross D. Well, we can see for this first part, A does not contain the number five, so it can't come from A cross B. And we can see that C does contain the number five, but D does not contain the number one. So it is impossible to construct the set five one from the left-hand side of our equation. So let me go ahead and write that out. So we have five one, and that is in A union C cross B union D. But five one is not on our right-hand side. It is not in A cross B union C cross D. And that is because 5 is not in A, and 1 is not in D. Great. So that completes this disproof here. So let's go ahead and get into our next one. So this one says, if A, B, and C are finite sets, then the cardinality of A union B union C is equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B plus the cardinality of C minus the cardinality of the intersection of A, B, and C. So... Just like the last one, we are going to disprove this with a counterexample. And for me, this one was the fastest because I just took like the simplest thing that I could think of, which is to let A, B, and C all be just the singleton one. So A equals B equals C, which is just the singleton one. So we can see that that means that the cardinality of A union B union C 
and that is equal to one. And that is because A, B, and C all contain just one element, and it is the same element, which is just the number one. And that brings us to the right-hand side of our equation. So we have the cardinality of A, B, and C first. And like I just said, the cardinality of A is equal to the cardinality of B, which is equal to the cardinality of C, which is equal to one. And that's because each of those sets only contains one element. So that means that the cardinality of A plus B plus C is just going to be one plus one plus one. So we'll have one plus one plus one for those. And then that's gonna be minus the cardinality of A intersect B intersect C. But the intersection of these three sets is simply just the singleton one because they are already exactly the same set. So that will be minus one for that. So this is one. So we'll have one plus one plus one minus one. And I think we can all do the math. That is going to be equal to two. But we can see that our left-hand side here is one and the right-hand side of our equation is two. And obviously that is not true. So that means that this statement is false. So that completes our disproof here. Great, so let's go ahead and get into another example. All right, so this one says, if x and y are real numbers such that x to the fifth is less than y to the fifth, then x is less than y. Now this statement, as it turns out, is true, and proving it is a little bit tricky, but I did the method of direct proof, although I think you could also do a proof using contrapositive, that might be a little nicer. So if you wanna do that on your own for homework, you can go ahead and do that, and post about it in the comments. So. Like I said, proceeding with the method of direct proof, we will be supposing that x to the fifth is less than y to the fifth. Well, from that, we can get that y to the fifth minus x to the fifth is greater than zero, as y to the fifth is strictly bigger than x to the fifth, which means if we subtract x to the fifth from y to the fifth, we will get a result that is greater than zero. Great, so we can actually factor this. So y to the fifth minus x to the fifth is equal to y minus x times y to the fourth plus y to the third x plus y squared x squared plus y x cubed finally plus x to the fourth which is still greater than zero. And from here we're going to note that there's only three possibilities for x and y. So we'll have that x may be equal to y, that x may be greater than y, and that y may be greater than x. Well, first of all, we're gonna do the case where x is equal to y, but we can see that if x is equal to y, then y minus x will just give us zero, which will make that whole thing zero. So if x is equal to y, then we will be left with the inequality zero is greater than zero, but obviously that is no good. So x cannot be equal to y as zero is not strictly bigger than zero. So then we will be looking at the possi two possibilities, which are that x is greater than y and that y is greater than x. So let's start with the second impossible one, and that is that x is greater than y. So if x is greater than y, well, if x is greater than y, that means that y minus x will be negative. But that may be okay, because our y to the fourth polynomial here that I will henceforth refer to as a for shorthand, could be negative as well, which would still give us a result that is greater than zero. But in order to determine if A is negative, we will have to look at all cases. So we're gonna be looking at the cases when both are positive, both are negative, when one is positive and one is negative, and when they're both zero. So let's look at the case where they're both positive. So if X is greater to, than zero and Y is greater than zero. Well, we can see from that 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 means that A will also be greater than zero as all of as there are no minus signs in our polynomial A, which means it is impossible for us to plug in positive numbers to that and not get a result that is greater than zero. So that's no good, as it means A will not be negative and we will not get a result that is greater than zero. So next, let's look at if both of them are less than zero. So if Y and X are both negative. Well, let's go ahead and write out our polynomial A here to see what signs will be generated by that. So we have y to the fourth plus y to the third x plus y squared x squared plus y x cubed plus x to the fourth. Well, right away we know that all even exponents will be positive. So let me go ahead and denote that by a plus. So that will be positive and this will be positive and this will be positive. And all we're left with are the odd numbered exponents. But because y is negative, y to the third will be negative 
But x is also negative, so that's two negatives, which means that when they're multiplied together, we will generate a positive. And same thing for this one over here, y is already negative and x cubed will also be negative, so that will generate a positive. So we can see that when we look at each of these terms, they will all be positive once it's all said and done, which means that in this case where both are negative, this will be greater than zero. And our last case will be if x is positive and y is negative, as we are specifically looking at x is greater than y. So if x is greater than zero and y is less than zero, because we are specifically looking at the cases where x is greater than y, this will be the only possibility here. So looking at our polynomial again, y to the fourth will obviously be positive as we have an even exponent. Then we'll have plus y cubed x, that will be negative as y cubed will generate a negative and x is a positive. Then we'll have plus y squared x squared, once again that will be a positive. And then we will have plus y x cubed, that will be a negative as our y is negative. And lastly we will have plus x to the fourth which is obviously going to be positive. So with this in mind, we want to prove the following inequality. So we want to show that the absolute value of y to the fourth plus y squared x squared plus x to the fourth will be greater than the absolute value of y to the third x plus y x cubed. And so in order to demonstrate the validity of this inequality, let's start by working with our right hand side here. And our right hand side is the absolute value of y to the fourth plus y squared x squared plus x to the fourth. So I want you to note that that is equal to y to the fourth plus, and we're going to factor an x out here, x times x y squared plus x to the third. Great. And so for our left hand side, recall that we have y cubed x plus y x cubed. And on this side, we are going to be factoring out a y. So we'll have y times y squared x plus x cubed. And so from here, I want you to note that the absolute value of x times xy squared plus x cubed is going to be strictly greater than the absolute value of y times y squared x plus x cubed as we have the assumption that x is greater than y, and in addition to that, we have a y to the fourth added to our left-hand side here. That means that this inequality is in fact true, which means that our polynomial up here will be greater than zero. And what does that mean? That means for this case right here, our polynomial will be greater than zero. And so we only have to check one last case to prove that the only possibility is that y is greater than x. And that is to show that when only one of these two, x or y, is equal to zero, that our polynomial will be greater than zero. So let's start when y is equal to zero. So when y is equal to zero, that means that x must be greater than zero, as we are working under the assumption that x is greater than y in this case. So let's go ahead and write out our polynomial here. So we have y to the fourth plus y to the third x plus y squared x squared plus y x cubed and then finally plus x to the fourth. Well if our y is equal to zero that gets rid of all of these terms here but then we're just left with x to the fourth but x to the fourth is positive which means that this whole polynomial will be greater than zero. Great and so that brings us to our last case and that is when x is equal to zero, which then of course means that y is less than zero as x is assumed to be greater than y. So writing out our polynomial again, we've got x to the fourth plus y to the third x plus y squared x squared plus y x cubed plus x to the fourth. And just like before, we can get rid of all of our terms with x, so that gets rid of everything except for y to the fourth. And our y is negative, but because it's taken to the fourth power, our negatives will cancel out, which will give us a positive result, which will make this greater than zero. Great, so now that we've taken care of that, what have we done? Well, let's go back to the top and remember. So recall that in the case where x is greater than y, our y minus x will be negative. And so what we've done is proven that, that no matter the x in y, our polynomial a will never be negative. 
which means that in order for our original inequality to be true, we cannot have the case where x is greater than y. So that leaves the only case which we have not explored, which is that y, which is that y is greater than x. And since we've proven that all other possibilities are impossible, this must be the case. So to wrap it all up, we went from x to the fifth is less than y to the fifth, and we got all the way down to y must be greater than x. Great. So that was a fun one. Let's go ahead and get into the next one. So for this one, we have there exist integers a and b such that 12 to the, I wrote an a there, there was a typo and it was written as x. So 12a plus 15b is equal to, and so as it turns out, this statement is false. And in order to prove it's false, we want to show that for all integers a and b, 12a plus 15b does not equal one. So let's go ahead and prove this statement I've just written out by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, we are going to assume that 12a plus 15b is equal to one when a and b are integers. So let's start by factoring a three out of our left-hand side here. So we'll have three times 4a plus 5b is equal to one. Then we'll divide that three over to the right-hand side. So we'll have 4a plus 5b is equal to one third. Well, right away, we have a contradiction because a and b are integers, and no matter what choices you pick for a and b, it is impossible to get one-third as your answer. So that contradicts our original assumption. Well, what was our assumption? That for all integers a and b, 12a plus 15b is equal to 1. Thus, we have disproved our original statement up here, and that finishes this disproof off. Great. So let's get into another example. Great, so let's get into our last example here. So this example says if A and B are sets, then the power set of A intersect B is equal to the power set of A intersect the power set of B. And it turns out that this statement is in fact true. And we're going to prove it using double inclusion, which we went over in the last video. So let's start with the forward direction. So we're gonna begin by supposing we have some set X, which is in the power set of A intersect B. Well, what does that mean? That means that x is a subset of a and x is a subset of b. But if x is a subset of a and x is a subset of b, that means that x is also a subset of the power set of a and x is also a subset of the power set of b by definition of the power set. So that very quickly finishes off our forward inclusion there. So let's go ahead and do the reverse inclusion. So for this one, we're going to suppose that X is in the intersection of the power set of A intersect the power set of B. Well, what does that mean? That means that X is in the power set of A and X is in the power set of B. But what does that mean? That means that X is a subset of A and X is a subset of B. But if x is a subset of a and x is a subset of b, then that means that x is a subset of the intersection of a and b. But if x is a subset of the intersection of a and b, then of course x is in the power set of a intersect b. Great. And thus, by double inclusion, we have proved our identity up here at the top. So that finishes this last example off, and that is a good place to stop.